how do you proclaim Jesus Christ? You know, that's the $24 million question. Is he God, part of the Trinity? Uh, no, with you folks, that's a stupid question. But maybe when somebody else hears that, they might wonder, is he a Jew? Is he a Christian? Or is it a little deeper than that? And the answer, of course, is everybody knows now. So, proclaiming Jesus Christ according to the secret. Um, I've told Tom I'm going to use this on every every. Uh, teaching on the secret because you, you can't leave home without this, folks. And you're going to find tonight when we discuss things that I am theologically bound to uh, dispensationalism for a good reason, and that dispensationalism without the God-man is very, very powerful because it allows you all the things we know of. Uh, it allows you to uh, proclaim Jesus Christ according to something that was very secret. You know, it allows you to, you know, make him, you know, who he is, not who theologians make him, and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, and you're going to find that I think there's no way to really put together the, the scriptures in a systematic way. And I am a systematic theolo theologian, if you will. That's kind of my training along with the languages. but. You and what we'll, we'll, let's just get into it. So, how do you proclaim Jesus Christ? Is it Jesus Christ the God man, part of the Trinitarian Godhead? No, Jesus Christ the only begotten Son. I should have put duh, but then is it or is it Jesus Christ the first Christian? And you'll be very, very surprised, you know, if you were to posit that to someone, they say, Okay, sure, yeah, yeah, I guess he was the first Christian. They don't you know, hardly ever. Do they think about that? Um, and then, um, or was, is Jesus a Jew? You won't expect the answer to that one, uh, because we're going to get into that. Obviously, uh, Jesus, the head of all principality and power, another duh. Uh, Jesus, the head of the body of the church, another duh. Jesus Christ, minister of the circumcision. What does that mean in Romans 8.15? One of my favorite verses for 2019. It might appear in every one of my teachings since January. Uh, that's a yes there. Jesus, Savior of the world. That was unexpected. Why does Bob say that? Because Jesus was supposed to be the Yeshua of the Jew, not the world. That was never in the cards. Can we say secret information that's not in the Hebrew Scriptures? Yes, Virginia, that's one of them. There are, oh, I'm not going to say hundreds, but just so many more stocked in the Pauline, Petrine, and Johannine epistles, church epistles, Bob, that make it um, so plain. I'm sorry, I didn't mute everybody. Please mute yourselves. I hear a little background noise. Uh, and this is going up on the YouTube, so yeah, yeah whatever. And, okay, last one. Jesus with whom we are joint heirs, brothers, etc. I love to read this week Hebrews, you know, in talking about God, in bringing many sons to glory. It's one of those fabulous, fabulous things where I'm there. I'm a many son. I'm, a, I'm going with Jesus to be in glory, in bringing many sons to glory. Uh, what a fabulous, fabulous piece of work that I think Paul did it in Hebrews. You guys may disagree. But um, anyway, so tonight's session on theology. Oh, God, here goes Bob again. Theology. Why? It's going to be on theology, folks. Um, and, 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 um, you want to call it scope of scripture? Feel free. Theology is a good word. In my day, uh, back in school, it was the queen of the sciences. That's a good word. Good theology is a good word. <laughs> but uh, here's Paul in, in, in Ephesians 4. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers uh, for the perfecting of the holy ones. The saints, the holy ones, for uh, the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Why? 
Well, till we all come in the unity of faith, faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, that would be great, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we may henceforth, that we henceforth, the reason for all these ministries and and or people and or, you know, our own, you know, assemblies, getting it straight and perfecting and loving and giving and speaking in tongues and all, that the church no more be, be no more tossed to and fro, carried about uh, with every wind of doctrine. The toss to and fro, that's like waves on the sea. And there's a reason Paul uses that language, but by the slight of men. So we don't want to be children, babies, uh, but we want to be, um, well, you'll see, tossed to and fro by the slight of men. So that's why we're tossed to and fro. And that's why we're into theology here, folks. And cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. They're not just, they're not in, in, in the classroom teaching you to help you. They're lying and wait to deceive. Uh, just imagine this. Nine, 2012, I began these research nights teaching this section of scripture because of the evil I see in theology in the world. They lie in wait to deceive. Do they know it? That's not the question here. There are men, evil men, women, that lie in wait to deceive the saints. But speaking the truth in love, that's one word in the, in the Greek, it's truthing it, uh, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head. There he is, Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together, compacted by that which what every joint supplies, not just the ministers up there, according to the effectual working uh, in the measure of every part, making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Just gives you uh, chills in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 chills in the body and the, the, uh, the whole understanding of the body of Christ. And, and with that, I just want to show you that from my perspective, folks, and the perspectives of the Berg, the Biblical Unitarian Research Group, we are Biblical Unitarian Dispensationalism based. Now, why, why are you, what do you, talk, who cares? Well, here's the big deal, and I promise in a future <clears throat> Zoom conference to do a series of teachings on developmental Christianity, what do you want to do, developmental theology. How do we get there from here? How do we get here from there? You know, the historical backgrounds of the the uh, church fathers, once the apostles died, and of course, tongues ceased, right? And the apostles died, and then people took over from these apostles, and they grew, and the, the church fathers wrote, people actually wrote uh, books, commentaries on the Christian scriptures, on the Hebrew scriptures, and they developed theologies. And then, you know, for how many thousands of years, you know, at least a good, uh, what, we'll call it 1,400, 1,350 years, the Roman church had a stranglehold on the people's thinking. Um, so anyway, I'll get into that sometime, but tonight, I just want to focus about where we are today in America, 2019. The, um, in the study of the evangelical theologies, there are essentially two competing persuasions. Covenant theology, and folks, this is important because of perspective. <clears throat> There's covenant theology and dispensational theology. Each is what <clears throat> we in the business call systematic okay, theology. <clears throat> uh, the goal being to put together the best scope of scripture, I gave it to you, and present it to the world for, uh, you know, correct message, okay, message in, in honor of God and his son, Jesus Christ. What's God's purpose of the ages, as Paul calls it in this letter to the Ephesians? The purpose 
of the ages. So think about what that might mean from the beginning age or this age to the one to come covers the whole gamut from the beginning to the end of our Bibles. What tack do we take? Can I spell that right? I think, no, okay. Uh, in explaining all the scriptures to attain the holy grail, grail of interpretation. That's what these systems propose to do. So what? Well, if it's a system, uh, I contend it's kind of like it's a machine. You know, if you're in engineering um, or any of the sciences, and it should be this way, formulas work. And they don't work. <laughs> and you lose, <laughs> and things blow up, okay? Systems need to be tight. So here we are. I've already said we're the biblical Unitarians. We're not in the orthodox bo box <laughs> right off the bat. We're non-Trinitarian. God is Echad <laughs> and not uh, a triad. Oh, that sounds like a good one, Steve. I'm going to use that. So here's Moses. Hero Israel, the Lord our God, uh, the Lord is one. The God, that's the NASB. So, and then if Moses said that for Israel, uh, it, look, simple slide. It, libraries of books written on this, but I'm giving it to you straight from the word, right? Text drives the bus. Not for us. Oh, excuse me. Yet for us, there is one God, the Father. Really? How hard is it? From whom are all things, and we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. I would love to see the REV, Rob. I'm sure it's better than that, but I, I should have, right? Okay, so I want to give you a brief background, because you need it, and you've heard it, and it'll ring true to you um, as, as you listen. Covenant theology, well, what is it? Now, I was, all my education were in covenant theological schools, <laughs> and I was a lone dispensationalist even back then in the 70s. Covenant theology is a position that says, um, the go-to position for the majority of the evangelicals, usually non-Pentecostal churches, for centuries. It's entrenched in the Trinitarian position, duh, and can only be approached and dismantled uh, by insisting that Jesus was a man a real man who didn't know everything. Uh, even our, some of our Unitarian brethren, um, th that would be the Anthony Buzzard School, Atlanta Bible College, uh, Church of God, the, uh, of the Abrahamic faith, Christadelphians, a lot of other groups, uh, still cling to that position. They teach that the Church of God, and that's a biblical phrase right there, that's why I put these in quotes, is some sort of spiritual Israel. Not a biblical phrase, and therefore must be, uh, and there, and there must be a seamless glide path from the Hebrew scriptures through the Christian scriptures to the end. You know, you can't have this intercalation where God has chosen uh, the church of God uh, as something different than Israel. Now, um, I was thinking of something, you know, they, they're Unitarians. Right, I don't know, you know, bless you if you've never had to argue the Trinity. I haven't argued anything like that in about 35 years when I was this brash, you know, Greek-wielding misanthrope who thought he had the world by its tail, and I didn't believe Jesus is God, and I would argue my waste of time. Um, but you'd think that once they cast off our Unitarian brethren, cast off the word trinity they might not just go pick up another one like spiritual israel but that's not the case and the reason we're talking about this is because of the next uh -huh. in 2002 this came across my desk uh, it was a it was an email and it was quoted it was one of our unitarian brothers so and they said this now listen carefully the teachings of Jesus are built upon or are in complete harmony with Moses and the Old Testament prophets. His teachings uh, were also consistent with the fundamental uh, to choose, uh, to those, uh, were fundamental to those apostles. Pardon me for the reading, folks. Um, 
in the New Testament, a harmonious, progressive, read blind path, theme is maintained throughout all the scriptures. The prophets, Jesus, and the apostles all remained faithful to the same theme and never contradicted one another. The theme is simply stated in the Gospels as the kingdom of God, um, or the synonymous phrase kingdom of heaven. The Gospels contain both the words and works of Jesus, words, works and words of Jesus. Both are vitally important and necessary to our understanding. We are not to elevate one aspect above the other. Yet today, oh, there is a widely accepted theological system which acknowledges his work but dismisses his word. Wait for this. They're, they're painting a straw man here, folks. The, the, well, the thought is that his teachings are to Israel and not to the Christian church, and that the apostles' teachings are addressed to the church, and as such, are more important than the Lord's. This theological system is called dispensationalism, and is characterized by dividing the Bible into dispensations or administrations. Numbers uh, varies between four and seven, with most uh, about seven. The dispensation is a, a dispensation is a period of time during which God deals with humans in a certain way. The belief is that each dispensation stands on its own, hence the segments. Uh, it 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 the, dis, the theology segments the Bible rather than considering it as one complete book. Now, outside of that being patently wrong as how dispensationalists think, the fact is. This is a straw man thing that, I mean, dispensationalists don't throw the words and works of Jesus apart. They don't not think he was speaking to the world <laughs> or even to us. But it's, it's, it's systematic error. And it again came across my desk last month. And then it got real personal. We're so excited, and this is the same group, that Spirit and Truth Fellowship International, that's John Shane Height, and a group out in Indianapolis in the world, has changed their tampering with the Great Commission text in Matthew 28, 19. The next step would be to baptize in water always as Jesus commands here. And then another one. Different Facebook. It's funny, right? Now you get to say this stuff on Facebook. Uh, and I'm, There's a point to this. We're going to get back to it, but I'm trying to show you. Well, one thing is they're trying to paint dispensationalists into a corner. Dispensations aren't times, time slots. We'll get to that sometime. It is, here's the second one. Utterly clear that false teachers try to pull us away from the teachings of Jesus. Uh, I hardly need to list all the sayings of Jesus where he makes uh, obeying him the issue. The Billy Graham system does not understand this and officially defines the gospel as the beginning and the ending with the death and resurrection. It would be, oh, what's the word here? It would, I would ask anyone working at this, I don't know what he's talking about, uh, to find a site, I guess that means a website, where the gospel is defined um, as the gospel of the kingdom, as Jesus preached it. Uh, Spirit and Truth Fellowship is on the record, oh my God, saying technically the four gospels are part of what is called the Old Testament. And then he quotes this. Okay, so big deal. What am I, this is the problem. I'm mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. I've told a number of my colleagues that I'm not going to go out and debate anybody. It's not worth my time. I did that with the Trinity. It's just not worth your time. You know, we're called to, <laughs> God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. None, one of them is not any bigger than the other, except that when, okay, one get in the door. But the fact is, we have a lot of people running around the world today that have been taught a lot of Bible, and they still don't get it. They don't. They haven't, <sighs> haven't maybe digested it to the point they still want to play church. They still want to, 
there, you know, there are, there are evil people out there trying to misdirect your children, your grandchildren, so that they can't even get in the door. They won't ever speak in tongues. They won't get there. And then there are those that lie in wait to deceive because they want to make the Bible so intellectual that there's no spirit in it, no angelic activity. There is nothing. It just drives me crazy. And then, of course, what really drives me crazy is one who misrepresents the position. So, Paul had some heavy words for those, and I never mince words. People say, oh, don't, don't call names, okay? Paul says, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, okay? And their work, and this is, I think, Phagellus and Hymogenes, no, no, Hymenus and Philetus right there, and their word doth eat as doth a canker. Dan Green, I think, is one of the more modern translations. I think it's King James. Yeah. Of whom is Hymenus and Philetus? Who calls them right out in Scripture? Who concerning the truth have erred? Don't be afraid to say that when you find people you know, talking about the Trinity or spiritual Israel or any number of subjects that are like plain as day, but we want to cover it up because it doesn't agree with our theology saying that the resurrection is past already. They overcome, overcome the faith of some bad, bad, bad lying wait to deceive. Here's another one. Titus holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught. This is Paul's teaching. I think it's here. It's um, Episcopos. He's teaching bishops, right? Uh, overseers as he had been taught, taught, that he may be able to, by what? Sound doctrine, both to exhort and convince the gangsters. Okay, so there's a little bit of argumentation there. Or maybe you want, don't want to call it argument. Well, defense of the gospel, okay? That's from Philippians. For there are many, ready? Many unruly, vain talkers, and there it is again, deceivers, especially of the circumcision, that's the Jews, whose mouths must be allowed to continue whenever you can, <laughs> who subvert whole houses. That recently happened to John Shane. I had this huge upheaval last year. And there's a reason for deception. Whole houses teaching things which they ought not for money. Follow the money. Um, so where are we going with this? Now, I'm mad as hell. I'm not going to take it anymore. By the way, you guys all know that this this is from the, the movie Network. <laughs> if some of you folks have never seen it, that's uh, Howard Beale. Yeah. He's fighting against the world. Well, I feel like that. So they need to be shutting their mouths. This is hyperbole for shut your mouth. <laughs> now, I won't be shushing anyone. Okay, it's not, oh, please, oh, please, please be quiet. Don't say that. Don't, no. There's going to be more. This is not going to be, we're, Remember that thing in Ephesians 4, it said, truthing it? I think I say it somewhere here. It's later. The best defense is a good offense. You, you don't go, I did this for years, back in 2000, 2004. I went on theological websites just to see what was going on. And I used to argue and spend time. And if you ever want to, you ever want to see what I wrote, it's under the uh, um, <coughs> pseudonym Robert Erasmus, I think it's on theologyonline.com, whatever. I wrote a lot back then, helped me develop a lot of my thinking. But this is, this is an important line in the sand for me. We're going to launch, the Berg is going to launch a Facebook page and just state the truth. We're not going to argue with people. If they want to argue, they'll get shut out. Um, if they want to have a reasonable discussion, we'll have one. But we're just going to teach the stuff we know there publish some articles, let people read simply how we think it should be taught and go, go on from there. So I'm going to step back again. And we're getting, you know, what are we at? Ten slides, I guess. Covenant theology, just wanted one more, just for those that you want to know, you want to check my words out. Uh, 
covenant theology, its earlier proponents called it federalism or federal theology as a system, has been a law, you know, the big kid on the block for about 350 years. Um, uh, Johannes Kosikas, uh, Francis Turntin, and uh, Herman Witsius, those are your dates, are considered the fathers of the system. Now, you can see by those dates, they're after the Reformation by nearly 100 years, okay? There's a de de developmental period out of the Reformation with Luther, Calvin, Melanchthon, Bullinger, Bullinger's grandfather. Uh, in similar fashion, um, these guys um, did, their, did their system, and uh, Darby, John, uh, who was John Nelson, Charles, no, John, J.N. Darby, John Nelson Darby's position within dispensationalist sphere for those who care about to read. Uh, here's what, here's the basic, again, mute you guys, mute yourself. Uh, they, they add covenants to scripture. One, the covenant of redemption. Another, the covenant of works. And then another, the covenant of grace. There's only one seamless glide path to the end. The Christian church is a spiritual Israel. And Jesus is the king right now. And the book of Revelation is not future. And I said further. Oh, oh, is not a further day of the Lord. And most cling to water baptism. Dispensationalism. How did it get here? Dispensationalism is considered by most the, uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know, my mainline evangelical theological people to be the new kid on the block. Uh, Post Reformation era, having only begun maybe the mid, uh, mid to late 19th, I say late, but mid to late 19th century, credited to be the work begun by John Nelson Darby. Uh, and there's his date, lived to be a ripe old man. Um, others working in the Plymouth Brethren movement. Do yourself a favor, read about the Plymouth Brethren. It's kind of like 150 years old in its development. The, the Plymouth Brethren were just kind of like the pilgrims, you know, uh, met from, they just would get together and discuss the scriptures like those in, in Berea who were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that uh, <laughs> they received the word that great, Eagerness, examining the scriptures, text is king, folks, daily to see whether those things were so. It's great stuff. So mainly, uh, you guys know <clears throat> the more uh, modern proponents of it in America, C.I. Schofield and in England, uh, E.W. Bullinger, and they were, Bullinger was actually considered an ultra dispensationalist, and, and his, his successor, Charles Welch, is like a ultra, ultra. Okay, so I'm raging against the machine. That's a group out of California. So we uh, have some work to do to convince you or others, I should maybe put others, that we wrestle against a Rube Goldberg machine of theology, a system that is older, more prevalent, but are out of whack, uh, but our uh, out of sort of an out of whack in our humble opinion, it does not recognize the biblical fact that Jesus did not know of the Church of God that began on the day of Pentecost, twenty eight E.C.E. Christian era, A.D. For those who like A.D., it confesses that Jesus is the King, and that this at this very time, and that Christians are somehow. Let them explain it. A spirit, we're spiritual Jews, uh, we intend to dis disavow of those persuasions. Not necessarily here, but as I say, we're going to launch something that will just be able to publish uh, and try to convince the gainsayers there, not by argumentation, but by defense and confirmation of the gospel. So how do we do that? <laughs> you argue, no. Um, it's been, here it is, the best defense is a good offense. And here's a good quote from George Washington. Just to bring it in, that might have been Vince Lombardi, right? But this is, you know, George, make them believe that offensive operation oftentimes is the surest, if not the only, in some uh, cases, means of defense. And I am so totally there. Uh, it, it, I'm out of defensive mode, Philippians, for the only right for me uh, to feel that uh, this way about you all, Philippians, because I have you in my heart, since both in my imprisonment 
and in the defense and um, confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of grace with me. Challenge the status quo. Push back against perceived or even real authority, um, just as someone in Palestine did in the first century, Jesus, Paul, and others. Now, here we go, and I'm going to probably, well, Rob, I told you slide 21 is probably 23, um, and we're on freaking, what, 12? No, I guess 12. We think that the secret of God is the apex of theology and the chewy caramel center. I've given you the three references here that use that phrase, and I use it in my book, God Had a Secret, as a jumping off point because of these three, three phrases are exactly the same. Uh, I'll give you a little hint here. Uh, my friend Ron Moon wrote me the other night. Uh, the one in First Corinthians two one is musterion in the Greek, not marturion, which is the word witness in all the critical. The best, so I use the best critical Greek text. Colossians two two mirrors the language of Ephesians, and then Revelation ten seventeen dispensations bleed into another. Hmm, that one's uh, hit the bird pretty hard, but I didn't write the book. We just have to deal with what does the text say in Revelation ten seventeen. It says the secret of God ends. Pretty straightforward. So back to the Romans thing that we were focusing on tonight. And to him who is able to establish you according to my good news or my gospel, the one that Paul talks about, and the preaching proclamation of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the secret in the times of the ages having been kept silent. That's Young's. I love Young's. Just brings the text out. So we're not in the orthodox box, okay? Jesus didn't know about the church, the body of Christ. He was a man. How could he know? Well, here's how he couldn't know. The church of God was those seven things. If you take your Bibles and read those contexts, I don't think we need to do that tonight. Uh, you know, if you, it was hidden wisdom. It was not made known. It was hid where? In God. That wasn't hid in the Old Testament, not in the Hebrew Scriptures. Literally, Paul says, hid in God. And Jesus is not God. He could not have known. It's unsearchable. The word riches is after that. It was kept secret. It was by revelation made known. And it was hid from ages and generations. How hard is that? If you read every one of those contexts, honestly, and read it in a good, read it in multiple translations. Don't let these guys with the theology degrees and translational bias pull the wool over your eyes. I mean, I got a couple of chapters penned, but not ready to publish it yet. Like God had a secret. What was the secret? What's a dispensation? Look, I know that in many of our, you know, spinoffs from the way international and even the way still teaches multiple dispensations to the tone of seven or eight there are three mentioned in Scripture. The one before the one we're in, and the one after the one we're in. The one we're in is called the dispensation of the secret. It's not a time period. The word dispensation, oikonomia, is house management. It's a management word. <laughs> but there's only three. So, you know, earlier you heard that guy. I don't know who it was that penned it. I just know he was from the, you know, the school of Anthony Buzzard that said, you know, we, there are time periods and they slice and dice the scriptures and you can't put it together. It needs to be seamless. No, <laughs> you say it needs to be whatever you say it is. I didn't write the book. You'll go argue with management. Management has given a dispensation, literally called the secret, to us. He gave it to Paul first. A dispensation is given to me, just like I believe it was Moses that had the first one. But we're not in the orthodox box here because covenant theologians, covenant theology, Westminster Confession, look it up. That's the Methodist school of covenant theology coming out of, I think it's Philadelphia. Um, early on, you know, John Wesley and how he was a, anyway. 
that's another night. So the church is either a secret or it's a continuation of Israel. You got to make your choice. Here's seven good reasons just on the surface, and there's many, many more that you should be thinking about the church as a secret. John Chainhat loves the term sacred secret. Fine with that. Got that from Rotherham, his translation of the term musterion in most places. I think it's all places, Rob, right? Anyway, the it's okay. I, that's fine. I like the secret capitalized or the secret of God. That just to me has impact. So here's some fun facts for you. This may be a shock to some. There is no church of Jesus Christ in the Bible. <laughs> I know, look it up. Text drives the bus. You find the text, I'll read it. The epistles say only, ready? Church of God, or church which is his body. Jesus was not, is not, never will be God. Hmm, can you say church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints? Do the Mormons have it? No, they don't. Church of God is the operative phrase. I think it's seven, maybe eight times in the Pauline epistles. You, you, you got to listen. Don't be an, the church of Jesus Christ. Oh, it's the church of Jesus. No, it's not. Jesus Christ. Okay, next one. Number two. The Gospels talk about a church a lot, right? No. The word church in the Gospels is used twice. Most of you know the first one, you know, when Jesus is in Caesarea Philippi looking at the Mount Hermon, the Mount of Transfigurations, and he says, you're Peter, but upon this rock I will build my church. Well, he does have a church. Jesus has a church. It's just not the one that we're in. And that's, I handled that on a few, a uh, couple of years ago. Read Hebrews 12 and you'll know exactly what church Jesus is building and why he said that on Mount Hermon. Anyway, there is no, uh, there are definite ramifications to believing Jesus as a man. You must let it sink in and interpret the scriptures accordingly. Look, he didn't know about it. Um, he just didn't know. Well, almost there, Rob. The beginning of, uh, excuse me, I just want, last thing, the religion of Jesus or the religion about Jesus. This, this speaks to the point, okay, I think I even say it right. This would be a pushback on, in the face, shut your mouth type thing to the idea that, I said it, guys, their mouths must be shut. I didn't write that. Paul did. But shut your mouth to the idea that dispensationalists do not respect the words of Jesus. Well, who is he speaking to? And that's their, whole, that's their whole metaphysical thing. He was speaking to the world. No, he was speaking to Jews. The world thinks he was speaking to the world, and they make him Muhammad Gandhi, and it really makes me sick because his words are so much more important in the scheme of the cosmic conflict, the, purposes of the, the purpose of the ages, and the trajectory in which God in the beginning created heavens and the earth, and there's a new one coming. Jesus' words are so far beyond Mahatma freaking Gandhi, but they want to make him that way. They want him to have this paragon of wisdom and, you know, just shove him full of crap. He spoke to Jews. He was a Jew. His religion was a Jew. He remains a Jew. He's coming back as king of the Jews, okay? There's a reason he's king of the Jews. Covenant theological people want to make the kingdom all about the world. Well, it's going to be about the world, but it isn't about the world now, and Jesus is next to the throne. He's not on it. If you just read what's written, it's important. See, this explains this. We don't respect, you know, they don't, the, the Gospels are part of the Old Testament. Yeah, they were. The Old Testament was still in effect. It is in effect, okay, in the Gospels. Jesus was a Jew. Where did he go? To church? No, he went to synagogue. He argued with the Jewish religious leaders. Yes, he did argue. <laughs> he, was, he was a Pharisee. He was trained as a Pharisee. He didn't, have the, he didn't have his doctoral degree. He knew their stuff backwards, and he knew their stuff so well. 
Yeah, I can show you he was a Pharisee in John. But, you know, there's a problem with theologians because he was a Jew, is a Jew, and will come back as king of the Jews. Jesus Christ Superstar tells you that. Who is this unfortunate cluttering up my hallway? Anyway, Bob, that just, that just limits him. Come on, it limits him. He's the end all and be all of God's purposes. He was, according to Paul, what he did was in accordance with the eternal purpose. What's the eternal purpose? That's a good question. We're not getting into that tonight. So we don't spread the words of Jesus. Really? Here's what they said. They don't think the Gospels apply to Christians. Really? Come on. Sermon on the Mount, how could you not? Uh, and this, of course, is the straw man argument against the dispensational viewpoint that we actually can read what's written and Jesus didn't know a few things. He's the only begotten son. Big deal. Listen to him, but, but he's not God. So um, before I go into the next one, Rob Woods has pointed out a problem for a lot of people when you start to interpret the word with Jesus as a man. And I, he, he really want, I don't know if you got anything to throw up on screen, Rob, if you want me to you know, stop sharing or you just want to talk, but this is a pretty big problem, and we've both seen it. I've seen it twice in the last two months that people don't want to say that Jesus didn't know something. So want to take it away? I'll take it away. You can leave what's up there up. But okay. first of all, what's the other usage of church in the Gospels? No, it's like in the next chapter, it talks about you bring him before the church for a witness. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty, you know, pretty mundane usage, you know, bring him before the assembly. Could have been a synagogue. It would have been a synagogue <laughs> back then. Yeah, there's only two. Um, when you try to talk about dispensationalism with some people, especially uh, when you try to present that Jesus was wrong on something, People just can't handle it. Even a lot of Unitarians just can't handle it, you know, because he's the son of God and he only spoke what the father, you know, told him to speak. I only do what my father tells me to do, things like that. And I, I got into a discussion, actually a couple of them a while back, and when I was trying to talk about this stuff, you know, and I said, well, Jesus didn't know. You know, he, he was wrong because he didn't know. And Frequently, at least what I had thrown in my face was Deuteronomy, and you don't have to go there, and I don't have to put it on the screen, but I'll, I'll just read it. Um, I think I'll read it. <laughs> I will read it. Sorry. Uh, Deuteronomy 18, uh, verses 20 through 22. They, they, pull this, they pull these verses up. But the prophet who dares speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet will die. And if you say in your heart, how can we know that Yahweh is not spoken? When a, part, when a prophet speaks in the name of Yahweh, if the word does not happen, it is not fulfilled. That is the word that Yahweh has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it out of his presumption. Do not be afraid of him. You know, they throw those scriptures up and they say, well, if Jesus said anything that wasn't true, then he was a false prophet. And, you know, what, what are you going to do about that at first? Yeah, well, it does say that right there. But the Bible is fairly full of a whole lot of examples where people who, uh, prophets who people do recognize as true prophets also prophesied things, and, and the prophecy changed. It's not that the prophet, not that God changed his mind or not that the prophet lied the first time and told the truth the second time. It's that the circumstances changed. Um, one, it, Samuel. Is, and also, a lot of this, you guys can just go on to the revisedenglishversion.com and read the commentary on Deuteronomy 18.20. A lot of that is right there. But uh, Samuel wasn't a false prophet. He told Saul that he would be king over Israel. And he says, uh, this is 1 Samuel 10, 1. Then Samuel took the vial of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, isn't it that Yahweh has anointed you to be ruler over his inheritance? This was Samuel anointing Saul. And then it took it away. In Samuel, uh, 1 Samuel 13, verse 14. And uh, one that 
I like is Nathan. Uh, Nathan was a prophet of God. He prophesied that David would have peace in his kingdom. You know, David was a man after God's own heart. And it says here, uh, 2 Samuel 7, 11, it says, even as from the day that I appointed judges to be over my people Israel, I will cause you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, moreover, Yahweh tells you, Yahweh will make you a house. But the, the important part there is I will cause you to rest. I will cause you rest from all your enemies. But then when David sinned, this man after God's own heart, when he sinned, the prophecy changed. This is the same prophet. It's Nathan. And he says, now, therefore, this is 2 Samuel 12, 10. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house. I mean, that's a direct contradiction of what was said just, uh, whatever, not that five chapters earlier. You know, peace will never depart from your house, and then now the sword is never going to depart from your house because, because of your sin, David. And another one is, and I don't think the reference is in here, does anybody remember, I know it's in Isaiah, is it Isaiah 35-ish, somewhere in there, where Hezekiah, uh, he's told he's going to die, and then he prays, and he gets, he gets more years. Right. Does anybody it, it's, it's, I think it's also in um, Kings and Chronicles, but paralleled in Isaiah. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm sorry, I should have looked this That's up. Okay. But no. I'm not, I'm not going to look for it right now, but... Uh, you know, I mean, you know, you know the record. Isaiah goes to Hezekiah and says, prepare yourself, get your affairs in order, you're going to die. Thus says the Lord, you're going to die. And then Hezekiah prayed, and God changed his mind, you know, and then Isaiah goes back to Hezekiah and says, thus says the Lord, you're going to live 15 more years. And so, you know, the point is, is that and maybe Bob could add on to this, but how we should take what is said in Deuteronomy 18 tw or 22, you know, when a prophet speaks in the name of Yahweh, if the word doesn't happen, is not fulfilled, then the word that Yahweh has not spoken, that is the word that Yahweh has not spoken. Um, because there were obviously many, and there's more examples too, but there's obviously many times that when a prophet said, this is going to happen, and it doesn't happen. This is going to, or this is not going to happen. And it happens. Things like Jonah was another one when he went to Nineveh. The city of Nineveh in 40 days will be destroyed. It didn't happen because Nineveh repented. Um, I've got, oh, and so you, you, if you bring that out to Jesus Christ, you know, he said all those things about, you know, some standing here uh, in uh, wherever the verse is, some of you standing here aren't going to die until all these things come to pass. I mean, he's talking about the end times, the eschaton, the tribulation. Some of you are going to see the Son of Man returning in glory. And it didn't happen. You know, Jesus was wrong. And the reason he was wrong is because he didn't know God's secret. And for a lot of people, that can be a tough, a tough pill to swallow to come to the realization that Jesus Christ is, in fact, a man, and that he did not know everything. There, you know, uh, things in the Bible, what, it's an accurate record of what happened and what was said, but everything that was said was not necessarily accurate, because the things Jesus said would happen within the lifetimes of some of those people present, it didn't happen. And it will happen, but it hasn't I, happened yet. I was just going to say, it's a timing issue. It always Amen. seems to be a timing issue. You know, I, I also respected the Jonah record because, you know, they repent and Jonah is just mad as hell. <laughs> it's kind of like a Pharisaic attitude. But, yeah, it's timing. The word that Yahweh spoke to Jesus was the word. It's going to happen. You know, this you know, time of great tribulation is going to happen. It's just the timing issue. Another one that comes to mind, Rob, and, and folks, is I actually think I have a slide on it later. Jo in Job, where, uh, you know, speaking to Rob's last point, it's an accurate, the, the, the Bible, the, the scriptures, that which we call the scriptures are an accurate uh, representation of actually what happened but, or, or, or what was said. But what was said isn't always right. So you, you got to be real careful. Job says, you know, shall we not receive good from the hand of the Lord and evil? 
I know I'd give it to you later, but, you know, in Job's circumstances, we think he was a patriarchal type, you know, way back when, 18 to 2,000 years B.C. They didn't know that God was all good back then. They didn't know anything about Satan or the devil or everything came from God. And so Job said that. Well, James kind of clears that up. And a few other people clear it up. There's only good things coming down from the Father of Lights. But it's progressive revelation in that particular sense. So, you know, we respect the words of Jesus, as this side says, okay? We just understand that circumstances, prophecy, things change, and therefore you have to change with it, or you're going to be lost in the sauce of covenantal theology, because covenant theology will take those verses that Rob just spoke about, you know, some of you standing here will not taste death, or this generation shall not blah, 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 until they see the Son of Man coming in glory. They'll take that and shove that into 70 AD and the destruction of Jerusalem by the Roman army, except that it happened in 68, maybe. But they say 70 AD, big deal. Uh, Jesus died 28 AD. Generations typically are 40 years. That's 68, not 70. The temple that Jesus Christ said, you know, all the stones are going to be, you know, knocked down. You're not going to see one on the other. And those stones are still there in Jerusalem today at the Temple Mount. They're huge. They didn't go anywhere. The reason he was saying that was they were huge. They were, you know, hundreds of tons. And what was going to happen when he predicted that which Daniel spoke, you know, when you see the abomination of desolation in the holy place, run for the hills. That didn't happen. There was no, there was no abomination of desolation in 70 AD, but a covenant theologian will shove something in there to make Jesus' words not what we just went through with you. He can't be wrong. Well, he was wrong. Okay. He didn't sin. He just didn't know. Job didn't know that everything didn't come from God. Who holds the power of death? Hebrews. The devil. Who does nasty ass things? Okay. I think we beat that horse. Okay. So we were talking about the words of Jesus up here. We don't respect them. We respect them. We just think about them. We're not stupid. So here's the other one. We love the red letters of Jesus. I, I think that slide long before this had um, something about how we didn't res- we, we respected his works, but we don't respect his words. Well, hint, the red letter, the red letters, some of you are not old enough, maybe you are. They used to publish Bibles with Jesus' words in red letters in the Gospels. Well, the red letters didn't stop. Galatians 1, 11 and 12. For I would, says Paul, have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it by the red letters of Jesus, (laughs) by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus kept and keeps on speaking today. We got lots of red letters. We respect the epistle red letters because they all came to Paul from Jesus. So what did Jesus know and when did he know it? I think I I probably should have let this go through, Rob, but he was a prophet. Uh, There it is. Uh, He didn't know about Christianity. He didn't know about Matthew 16, 18, upon this rock I will build my church. No, that's not about Christianity. That's about Jesus' church in heaven. Again, go to Hebrews 12. The assembly, the ecclesia of the firstborn. The firstborn is singular. It's angels. There's, there's going to be a war in heaven. Jesus is the head of all principality and power. He's building his church. He's building his assembly. And not knowing something, there it is, Job 2.10. Okay, 
Jesus didn't know about the tribulation. Rob went through that. He didn't know who touched him in the crowd. He grew in wisdom. He doesn't know the time of his return to the planet, neither the angels nor the son, but the father only. I think that's in Mark. He didn't know stuff. So, don't, I mean, don't freak out. Roll with it. Let it roll around in your brainia, right? So, again, we're not in the orthodox box. Another thing that covenant theologians want is you to be dunked. Well, we're non-dunkificationists. It's spirit, not water baptism. And if you don't see this, it's because you don't see the progressive revelation of Scripture. Circumstances change. Prophecy makes it change. People believe. Hezekiah changes his mind. You know, the Ninevites, and I love that. The Ninevites were Gentiles. They changed their mind. And the, and the Israelite prophet Jonah freaks out. Well, here's another one. Water baptism. I'm going to take five seconds here. Number one, water baptism. You want to be immersed. You want to be sprinkled. You want to be dry. I don't care. Water baptism is not a commandment in Scripture in the law. John the Baptist started it. Jesus continued it. It was working. There is You work the word back. Read John Lynn's great book about uh, baptism. He's got a really good book. Um, so if you think water baptism gets you saved, or you think water baptism is a, something you have to do because Jesus said, uh, in Matthew 28, 19, go into all the world, make disciples, and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. You know, then they call that the Great Commission, right? Because Jesus said it, it had to be done. Well, folks, it never was done. I call that verse the Great Omission, because that's not the Christian's commission. He was speaking to Jews. He was telling them to go out and baptize in water, circumstances change. Here it is. Circumstances after Matthew 28. Gathering themselves together, he, Jesus, commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father, what the Father has promised, which he said, you've heard of me for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized in water too, so that you get all wet in your theology. You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Little H, little less in my book. First Corinthians, then later, Paul's writing, verifying writing. For by one bowl of water, you were all baptized into one body, whether you were Jews, Greeks, whether you were slaves or free, and were made to drink in one spirit. No, baptized in one spirit. So we're non dunkificationists So, you know, the buzzard group wants. Thank you, SDFI, for not tampering with the text. Well, I, I have some arguments with John Shane about how, how he handled the text there, because I do know the lectionary from which Eusebius quoted, and it doesn't have the word Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It has in his name, and Father, Son, and Holy Spirit never was the formulaic baptism in the book of Acts. In fact, you can read it for yourself. You know, first Corinthians, was it first Corinthians? Maybe say Paul was really happy he didn't baptize everybody <laughs> because it was making it was making a name for himself. He didn't need it. He just he wanted he wanted Christ, Christ in you, Christ the cross. Da, 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 da. You know, spirit baptism. It morphed. Progressive revelation never hurt anyone, except for covenant theologians. We, in the biblical Unitarian Research Group, and soon to be on Facebook. We are progressive revelationists. God changes his mind. Dispensations happen. Key to understanding God is that he's not a stuffed shirt. He's not a static savior. He's not in control of every molecule in this universe. And if you could just get that one out of your mind, the limited, yes, he limited himself by creating beings who make choices, cosmic and earthly choices. Somebody's going to try to ascend into the mountain of God and take over in the future. Hasn't done it yet. God listens to prayer and changes his mind. So we're progressive revelationists here. 
we're not in the orthodox box. We're non-cessationists. Speak in tongues. Utilize all nine manifestations of the Spirit. You guys know these verses. I ain't going there. And it says, Paul says, I would be all spoken tongue. Take that commandment and do it. Okay. We're not in the orthodox box. We're mortalists. The dead are well dead. Can you say resurrection or rapture? And I, I quote this one here where it says that you can read this some other time. We're probably a pretty pretty going pretty late here, but um, you know, David has not ascended. Only Jesus has ascended, right? David's in the grave. Why can't they just read that? Oh no, after Jesus, then there were, heaven was available. That's what they teach in covenant theology. Heaven wasn't available to Jesus got there. What a bunch of malarkey. What's wow. Malarkey, where is that from? So, okay, we're not in the orthodox box. We're rapturalists. Yeah, covenant theology does not believe in the rapture. That's because they don't think the church was anything different than Israel. The resurrections are for Israel. The, oh my God, secret rapture is for the church of God. Let's read this one. See, I'm giving you the revelation of the secret. This is the Bible in basic English. Sometimes I love this. Sometimes I hate it. But here was great. See, I'm giving it because it's kind of a paraphrase, but here the word secret is musterio. Um, see, I am giving you the revelation of a secret. This is like a secret within a secret. We will not all come to the sleep of death. See, sleep, sleep. They're in sleep. But we will all be changed in a second, in the shutting of an eye, at the sound of the last horn. For at that uh, sound, the dead will come again, free forever from the power of death. And we, he's, he's talking to his congregation, we will be changed. Okay, so those guys, you know, are going to be broken the power of death, but we're going to be changed. For the body which comes to destruction will be made free from the power of death. That's parallel to the verse before. And the man who is under the power of death will put on eternal life. But when this has taken place, then that which was said in the writings will come to true, come true. Death is overcome by life. O death, where is your power? O death, where is your pains? The pains of death, sin, power of the sin is the law. Wow. But praise be to God who gives us the strength to overcome through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a revelation of a secret. Let's just read the last one. The rapture is real. <laughs> is real. For this we say, Paul, later, okay? Thessalonians, well, actually it was earlier than 1 Corinthians. So, uh, for this we say to you, by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain into the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Same language. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and we love it, and with the trumpet of God and the dead, where? The dead in Christ will rise first. The dead in Christ. You, you're not in Christ until he's died uh, resurrected, ascended, and sat and gave the Holy Spirit. There's no in Christ relationship in Israel. That's another whole teaching. But the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So, <laughs> These are things that we're, I'm trying to show you the difference in why you think, you, why you are who you are if you're a dispensationist. We're not in the kingdom yet. Jesus not, is not the king at this time. Now, listen, listen, he was prophesied as coming king. That was one of David's, one of David's descendants would sit on the throne, right? He was announced as king by Gabriel, you know, glory to God in the highest. Peace to men of his goodwill, you know, in the city of David, there's going to be born. You read, the, read the language in Luke. It's about his kingship. He will sit on the throne of his father, David. He will. Does it say he, when he's born? Does it say when he was resurrected? He just says he will. 
Jesus prayed for God's kingdom, what? To come, hmm, not there when he was on the planet. Jesus is portrayed as king in the book of Revelation, so we must get rid of that issue. There is a kingdom. We're just not in it. And this, 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 yeah, this stuff, you know, oh, Christians are the king's kids. No, we're not. We're his brother. You know, we're joint heirs with him. We're, we're many sons that are being brought to glory. We're going to be in his posse, my opinion. I think we could throw it out there. We're going to replace fallen angels. But that's just me because we'll have bodies like unto his glorious body. Um, but that's the whole thing. That's a really fun one. Look, we're not sheeple, people. You're not even showing the sheep. Think for yourself. Stop letting others think for you. You're not a poor little lamb. You've lost your way. Help me, Mr. Preacher. Ba 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 humbug. You are not a spiritual Jew. You are not confined to a theological box, okay? We talked about it this week, that the last week too, in Alana. You can't argue with people. We don't want to argue. We just want to state, you know, it's the church of God. It's not the church of Jesus Christ. It's the body of Christ. It's not spiritual Israel. How many times was that term used? Once. How many times is the body of Christ used? Thirty. Which is the better metaphor? Uh, you know, it was secret. How many things I showed you? Seven. I think there's ten. There was a secret rapture. Or see, I showed you a revelation of another secret. It's a secret within the secret of God. Not only do we get the whole dispensation, which is called the dispensation of the secret, there's a secret rapture within there that was not known about. And it was unsearchable riches. Greek word, used twice, can't change it. Unsearchable or untrackable are the only two uses. The untrackable riches of Christ. He was, you know, I've got a paper started somewhere where it's like, okay, like I said it for like first slide, you know, Jesus was supposed to be the Yeshua, Savior, coming one, Christ, Mashiach, anointed, for who? The Jews. What did he be, what is the, what does first John say? He's the Savior of the world. That's something secret. You, you have to see language and allow God to change his opinions. And it, you know, who was it? Uh, maybe it was Rob earlier this week said, you know, <laughs> in that Acts thing, or maybe it was Michael, I don't know. They said, well, when is the sign of your coming? And when are you coming back? And when are we going to take over Israel, right? Peter, James, John. You know, they knew their Bible. Their Bible showed that Israel was going to kick butt, take names, get the land, get the throne. And the Gentiles, the other nations of the world, were going to be bring their riches to Jerusalem, to the king, Jesus. They knew that. When are you coming back? We want that right now. And what does Jesus say? He goes, I did God. It's, in, it's in God's hands. I don't know. I don't even know the exact quote, but that's. <laughs> so this stuff that is palmed off as Christian theology where you, I'll let them explain their stuff. I, I had to read it for eight years and, and argue because I needed, I wanted a degree and I wanted to learn theology and I didn't want to be stupid and I wanted to make sure I was covering my bases and I wanted to look under every rock. I looked well, under a lot of rocks, not every rock, but it, uh, butting heads with theologians and stuff, it's just not, my makeup is to speak forth the truth, to truth it, to, because I know there's, there are people lying in wait to deceive and they're insidious and they're evil and they will change entire households and throw them under the bus, but and then their and then their their lives are a wreck. So we're going to start. We're going to stand against. You know, we're going to take unto the to us the armor of God, sword of the spirit, and we're actually going to battle. You know, in the intellectual community, we're going to put this out there and let people see that they can still speak in tongues. 
they can operate, if that's the better word, they, you know, distributing as he will, those manifestations that are necessary to heal, will get people out of the fire with this stuff. You know, dispensationalism today in the world, Dallas Theological and so forth, they can't get out of their own way because Jesus is still God. They can't put it together. They cannot. We have to do that. Big words, Bob. Big words. So, I, you guys, I think that's it for me. Um, Berg, any comments? Or um, I'll let the Berg speak first if there's things they noticed or want to say. I want to say something about Matthew 28, 19 and the, the translation in the REV. Uh, John did used to, that used to say, uh, teaching them, go therefore and um, teach all nations in my name. That used to be the text in the REV, and John based that off of uh, Eusebius. You know, I'm sure you know all about that because he quoted some texts that were supposedly older than the oldest extant manuscripts and everything. But apparently, there there's some evidence has come up that Eusebius is also quoted as saying the traditional uh, Matthew 28:19, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and so. I think that John still believes that the original was teaching them in my name, but because he too, Bob, wants to be honest to the text, he doesn't feel that there's adequate proof that you can actually change the verse to that. I mean, if if this subsequent evidence hadn't come up, and I, you'll have to ask him for the details about Eusebius also quoting the traditional version, then I'm sure he, John would have left it in there. But in order to be honest to the text as, as much as he could, he, he, yep. he put back the traditional translation. Yeah, I understand. I, text criticism is not an easy thing. That was lots of classes and stuff. And, you know, I remember back in the day when uh, Walter Cummins was, had to go over to Germany, and uh, you and I talked about this, that, you know, he would be looking for manuscripts. It, it's, it's a science. It's a huge science. And they're still digging stuff up. But the fact is, even if Eusebius said it one place, one or one place, the other, what actually happened? Nothing. <laughs> it didn't happen that way. Never did. And you'd figure it would. Um, yeah, the evidence is pretty clear that Jesus didn't use a Trinitarian formula, you know, or excuse me, the first century church didn't use a Trinitarian formula, you know. And, 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 Textually, I agree. You know, it, it is, and that's kind of theology. That's where that's where text and theology weave, and it, it is it is it, it's a very care, careful weaving because there's some things about the secret that I decide in my work that the manuscript evidence is weak, but it's there, and it, it it's pretty obvious from the context that it context that it has to be there the way the the weaker manuscripts say. So it's not always a case, and you'll find this with Bible translations. I know this is probably boring. Bible translations are theological. The NIV in Ephesians is nigh on to maddening to me. They stick words in about Jews, and they stick words in so that you just kind of lose the fellow heirs, fellow members of the body, fellow this, fellow that. You, you know, with the Jews, it, 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 you know, it's kind of hard for me to take and it's funny that you bring that up alana and i were talking last week actually i was listening to one of uh, a teaching and i made the statement yeah this is this is one of those places where it's a textually transmitted disease <laughs> i said heck i said that so i'm going to have a, a nice new series on textually transmitted diseases <laughs> and it'll be fun but it's a science, you're right. It's absolutely a science. And even if you've got heavy metal on one side and sour cream on the other, sometimes the sour cream had, you know, it has, has been pushed down by tradition and so forth. Makes me think of Arius and, and uh, the, you know, the, the uh, councils that finally decided on the Trinity, right? The works of Arius, uh, he was brilliant, by the way. You won't find his stuff for dust because they burned it all. So you got to be real careful uh, 
with that kind of stuff. But thanks, thanks for that comment. I mean, I love John's work. He's working feverishly. He's been doing so for what, like 40 years on that thing. And it's the best around. Par excellence. Right now, it's the best around. His commentaries, we're working on it. <laughs> Um, I guess Michael didn't get to show up. Michael Lewis was, <laughs> he was teaching an OSHA class tonight. He really wanted to get out and go. Uh, but, uh, and because he had some, he's the one, he's the one that came up with don't leave home without it, meaning this, you know, proclamation of Jesus Christ according to the secret. You know, don't leave home without that. Start it, start the conversation there that the church was a secret. The dispensation was a secret, that there is a secret rapture, that there's lots of, there's a lot of other secrets in the Bible, and this isn't the only one that Jesus talks about the secret, secrets of the kingdom during his time, stuff he didn't even know about and was teaching his disciples that also weren't in the, you know, Hebrew scriptures. So, uh, and I guess he didn't make it. And I'll close tonight then with the, the, uh, the assurance that next month, uh, there'll be a TextWorks next month, mid, mid-Wednesday, for those of you who are in TextWorks, which is, you know, where we really spend the whole, you know, hour and a half, you know, you know, bouncing around the Bible, asking questions, documenting, doing things just like Ray said, uh, you know, fixing things and, and trying to understand what things mean uh, in a very open, this, you know, not in-your-face slideshow like we do here. Uh, and then Research Night next month, is the cosmic powers and the secret of God. Why were angels watching to see what was supposed to happen? And why did they miss it? And why that's important for your life? Why were the rulers of this age so wrong? Because had they known, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. Why were the angels it says in First Peter, they were lusting after this knowledge. Why? And then in First Timothy 3.16, which is the major portion of what I'm going to teach, why does it say that um, this administration, this dispensation was seen of angels? Well, there's a, there's a huge reason. It has to do with Genesis 1, Genesis 6, the Watchers, the Book of Enoch, and oh boy, the Book of Enoch will be front and center next month. And then December, I'm only going to do one night. That's going to be the 18th. Tom and I are working on a redo of my teaching back in 2000, what, 13, Tom, was it? God, gods, and the sons of God. We need to get that straight again and give people an idea of why God has a council. He asks them questions. He sends them to do things. And let us make man in our image. So we're going to get into that in December. And that will be the 18th. So I don't, I always try to shove too much into December. So I'm, I'm not going to do it. But this is going to be a good one. We'll give you all the evidence of the council, what they were for, why they were developed, why God gave jurisdiction uh, to the sons of God, Deuteronomy 8.32, uh, over the nations, why you see that played out in Daniel, where the, you know, the prince of Tyre, or is it the prince of Greece, thwarted the angelic being trying to re reach Daniel. This is all stuff that should ring soundly into your life, because, um, you know what, angels, Jesus Christ could have called on 12 legions of angels, and he didn't. And we get so high and mighty thinking we have Christ in us. Jesus had Christ in him. He needed angels. You have Christ in you. You need angels. They're ministers of those who are heirs of salvation. They work for us. And if you don't know how to call on an angel, you got to get it. I pray for them every time I pray. If they're available, Lord, send them. I need help. Send them. Help my eyes, you know. Do he could have called them. Well, he didn't, and he knew better, and you do. You operate the manifestations. But if you're not asking for them, there ain't he. you have not because you ask not. Ask for them. Don't be shy. So we'll get into that December. God, gods, and the sons of God. And with that, I thank you so much for coming.
and um, we'll see you next month.